Hi, John. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you for being back. This one, I kind of want to focus on some of the key philosophers that you've been interested in in your work. So mm -hmm. who's your favorite philosopher or the one that's been <laughs> most important to you and your work? I, you know, I think... Um... I think honestly, the philosopher that is that is most <clears throat> that I feel most intimately connected with is Plato. Where the very first uh, philosophy class I took, uh, I didn't even want to take it, <laughs> but I, I my friend dragged me into it, and I thought, oh, who wants to do this? But we read um, Plato's Apology, Socrates, Socrates' you know speech at his trial, and I found it extremely gripping, and that's that's what led me to want to take other philosophy classes, and uh, I. I mean, that was in 1980 something or other, 40 years ago. Uh, and I, I basically lived with Plato and Plato's writings for 40 years. Uh, so, you know, it's not the thing I've written the most about, um, but, uh, but that is the true answer to, to uh, which philosopher is most, uh, mo matters to me the most. Uh, and why? So you've, you, you look a lot about, you said, human relationships off the air and in, in yeah. your, your, of your books and on normal everyday experience. And um, so what does Plato say about, about our experience yep. and about, about daily lives? I think that, I mean, the reason that, uh, that Plato is so uh, compelling to me, I think um, there are a few reasons. I think the first one is that, you know, he, write, he writes in dialogues. And so he doesn't write treatises. So it's much more in a way like reading a play than anything else. And so what his writing is always about is human conversations. And I think that's, I think that is, in fact, where we live. Like we, you and I are doing it right now, but you know, our, our relations with other people are, are all take place in these activities of of gesture and expression, and that I think is the most important thing for us to understand. And so, I think the Plato's writings uh, are just extremely um, insightful and subtle in their portrayal of human conversations, and by the way he writes his dialogues, he allows you to see and understand a lot of, about those things. So that's, that's the one reason. A second reason is that, again, because he writes dialogues rather than treatises, there is no point where he tells you, here's the answer, or here's what you're supposed to think. <coughs> Excuse me. So the dialogues, uh, in, in order for you to appreciate them, in order for you to learn from them, uh, the dialogues require that you put a lot of effort yourself into asking, why did that person say this? Is that claim true? Should I agree with that? And so I think he has, a, in a pretty unique way, developed a writing style that requires a great deal of input from the reader in order to make the thing work. So, I, so that's a second reason. Uh, and then, so the first one is that, it, you know, it's all about dialogue. The second one is that it requires you to be in dialogue with the text. But then the third one is the particular things that uh, come out of that. You know, what what you learn from studying the conversations he writes about, uh, you, you learn about the, really the richness and complexity of human life. You learn about the real issues that people deal with. Um, you're forced to think through all the deep, questions of philosophy like what's the mind what's the body what's the nature of being and so on but but they're they and you know different characters especially socrates says many truly insightful things about those issues uh but uh mostly what what you end up seeing is how much those issues are alive in everyday life and also how much the, i i think that the a point that really ends up coming out of it is that those issues really matter because of how they impact everyday life. You know, they're, they're, his, his account of things really always ends up being oriented towards the good, towards do we behave well in our relations with each, other's and, with each other and so on. Uh, so anyway, I, I, th those are the reasons I, I find them so compelling. Like they just, uh, when, when I read those books, I spend a lot of time just sort of dwelling in the, intricacies of human life with some through the dialogues with some very intelligent companions and i i just find them extremely rewarding for those reasons i really like that answer talking about how you kind of learn about the complexity of life and everyday life 
um, because I've actually been um, reading some of the biologist um, Joyce uh, Benning Benningson. I think uh, she she does work on the differences between male and female, and she makes a point that we kind of um, we've kind of lo in, in having smaller family sizes nowadays, and having less contact with say extended family, and even having fewer friends, we kind of just have less contact with with people, whether it's different mm -hmm. siblings of different ages, different sexes. So we kind of learn things in our daily life from from dialogues and just interacting. And so it's kind of I never really thought about it so much, but um. If you have dialogues in a book, you know, we're constantly kind of playing with books, right? And we're thinking, yep. you know, and we, 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 it's, it's just so great to get a sort of a, a, a perspective on something that we've never seen before. So, so does that, you know, does that dialogue aspect of it give it like casualness? What, what kind of insights do we, do we get out yep. of it that we, we might not get if it's just someone telling us it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the thing you said about contemporary life is pretty important. I, I think about this. I have a seven-year-old son. And I, I watch him as he's growing up. He's a wonderful fellow, but I watch him as he's growing up, and and I often think back on my own life, and I notice differences. Like I spend a lot more time outside playing with kids in the neighborhood than he does, and and that's because things are a little different on this on the street in 2023 than they were in whatever 1965 um, when I was a kid. Uh, the, you know, there's, I think our lives are much more. Uh, contained in the house and especially in the days in the days of the internet now you know and and as post uh, pandemic um th there's been such a, a cultural thrust towards withdrawing from the social world and being in these sort of isolated little units and so on uh, and, and so i think for, for those and you know all kinds of other reasons i think it really is the case that uh my son growing up has a lot a, a, a very, a, very a much, re much more restricted range of encounters with other people through whom he would just sort of gradually learn about the human world, you know. And that, and so I think, yes, I, I think that is where things really do happen. And so, so that leads me then to try to think how can I improve that for him. But that's also then why books like that I think are important. You know, there's um, there's a the, this uh, the author uh, Elen Siksu, uh, who's a uh, more or less a, a sort of a Derridian uh, feminist philosopher who we might know. Uh, she has a book, I think it's in her book, Coming to Writing. And she talks about her experience growing up and uh, essentially retreating into books. When when her situation of living in her little family or whatever was frustrating, in fact, it was in the pages of a book that she started to find the world where she could feel like she belonged. And I, and I do think that is a real power of books. And so exactly now going back to this theme about Plato, uh, but other things too, other kinds of literature too. Uh, I think th those books that put you into the domain of human dialogue really do offer a, a, a very, very powerful supplement or sometimes corrective to our actual social world. because. They do. I mean, they're not they're not real conversations exactly, but they but they do something very similar. You know, they they put you into the world of, if, especially if they're well crafted books, they put you into the world of human exchanges, and you can learn from them the kinds of things you would learn from dealing with people. So, so I yeah, I mean, I think that's why I often would try to get people to read Dickens and Faulkner sometimes rather than the standard textbooks of philosophy because I think. You know, I try to introduce those things into my courses because I think uh, there's so much to learn about just sort of sympathy for the human world by by reading good literature about that. But that is, I think, why Plato is then so powerful because it it brings that that literary power of putting you into the world of human discourse together with study of the deep philosophical issues. You mentioned your seven year old son. Yeah. Um, what is the philosophy of, of childhood? Um, and what have you learned mm -hmm. having a child? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, the, the, that again, is, that's an issue that uh, was on my mind since I was a child. My dad was a psychiatrist and uh, uh, more or less a existential, existentialist, I think. Looking, looking back now that I know some things about that, I think he was more or less an existentialist. Um, but he was very concerned about the, um, 
respect for children and uh, frustrated at the ways children often weren't taken seriously enough and weren't treated well. And so that's a thing that he, you know, communicated to me. And so since I was a kid, that that's been a thing on my mind. And so that's the, my first real book, um, Human Experience, was my attempt to address that issue in a way, the the issue of what it is to be a child and how the kinds of experiences we have as children make us who we are as adults. And I think that the most, I mean, there are many, many things to say about childhood, but I, but I, the, I think the thing that I most sort of pick up on there is that, and in fact, you can find this in Plato, in the Republic. Um, I think that children, children are uh, on the one hand, extremely eager. Like they come out into the world, like full of energy. They, they want to learn. They need to learn. They're very excited and the world is exciting to them. So they come with that eagerness. Uh, and what they're really also then looking for with that eagerness is a kind of answer to the question like, what should I do? How should I live? What am I? How should I fit in? You know, so that there's a kind of eagerness uh, and and also this kind of questioning. And that's the thing that parenting fits into. And so their children then, in their response to those family groups that they grow up into will seize upon an answer. You know, the way that parents set up a situation will be what the child takes as the answer to, oh, I guess this is what I have to fit into. I guess this is how I should be. And so that can either be very empowering or very debilitating, you know, depending on what what kind of model of parents are presenting. But I think that's the that's the thing I have really focused on when I think about childhood the way that children are so deeply dependent on this uh, sort of dialogue with their parents, where what's really at stake there is the question, who am I for you? And, you know, how are you going to recognize me? So, you know, I've been very uh, influenced uh, by Hegel's uh, analysis of, of what he calls the dialectic of recognition and the idea that, um, our ability to develop a sense of ourselves is really dependent on the kind of feedback we get from other people and, and what they communicate to us about who they take us to be. And, and we develop our sense of self in a kind of dialogue with other people's perspective on us. Uh, so I, I, I think that's a hugely powerful theme for studying human life in general, but I think it's especially important for thinking about children because that's what children are grappling with uh, with their parents, um, the perspective of their parents is the one that matters most to those children in, in trying to answer this question, like, am I okay? Who Am I someone you're going to accept? And the power of the parents to accept or reject, to uh, support or humiliate, you know, is extreme. And so children, it seems to me, are are really defined by that dialectic of recognition with their parents. And that, I think, is the, the most important thing for understanding if we're trying to understand where mental health comes from or mental ill health, mental illness comes from. You know, I think that's, that's what really ends up shaping whether as we move into independent adult life, uh, we come into that in a healthy, well-developed way or we come into that in a, in a crippled way. Um, that, so that's been, that's been my... Um, my real focus uh, in thinking about childhood. Uh, and I really do think that's one of the biggest topics that we should be concerned about. Yeah, it's, I actually talked to a clinical psychologist recently on the podcast. And so the issue of thinking about just how much we're uh, shaped as children um, is, it's been really interesting to me, you know, and even thinking about, you know, what things do I like, what thought processes, what parts of myself have, have been shaped from such a young age. And um, like the way you talk about it, there's a kind of necessity there. You you, you kind of become a person through those interactions. So they're, yeah. they're so essential and in a way positive, but the the positivity is also kind of wrapped up with, with uh, like negativity, right? Any, any problems that you develop in a way, you know, arguably are also part of that and mm -hmm. uh, the ways that you got recognition from your parents. Uh, and and from people around you, um, I, I yep. wonder um, some another another person that you work on that I've um, been interested in is Freud, 
So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if uh, you could say anything about who who Freud was, what we what we understand about him, what we've learned about him, and and what he has to say about childhood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Freud Freud is is definitely a, a figure that I've been interested in. He's not one of the biggest ones I've worked on, so I don't think of myself as a scholar of Freud. But I have certainly mm-hmm. uh, uh, I've written about it, and I've taught Freud a great deal for exactly these reasons. I think that Freud um, is really um, really focused on what's going on with children in the context of their family lives. And, you know, he's a real uh, pioneer, I think, in um, in understanding the unique domain of childhood life. And I think, uh, you know, what, what he is particularly countering or, you know, speaking against is a kind of um, either the idea that children – are just sort of uh, things over there that aren't really absorbing what's going on around them, or that they're already little independent adults. You know, I, I think against both of those views, he's really focused on how much the child in the family setting is a person in formation, and how much everything that's happening is shaping this person. And then Freud also uh, especially emphasizes the things that happen not at the level of you know people exchanging concepts through sentences they speak, but you know how things happen by the way the child is touched by the way the child gets to use its body you know the things that are communicated by all kinds of media other than you know the the passing of concepts through through words and so on and so I think one of the things that is most powerful in Freud is his study of the growing child and i mean it's, it's really the the tiny child and what things are really defining the child's perspective that are quite different from the adult's perspective so you know he talks about the the oral stage which means the child you know when it's a few months old um biggest event in its day or in its couple of hours is nursing at the mother's breast. And so for the child, like this sort of pivotal point of experience is this thing that happens in its mouth. And, you know, Freud sort of talks about how, you know, for you or for me, we're grown up people and, you know, we've developed huge, rich lives and we've sort of made what happens in our mouth a very isolated and sort of limited thing. But that's not what it's like for the child. For the child, that's the place through which it's sort of experiencing the world in the most exciting ways. And that's part of how, or that's that's where the child is connecting with the world and where it's developing its sense of interaction. And the child's relationship to its body changes over the early years. And so, you know, uh, when it's, when it's a, uh, that small, like you put diapers on it and it just pees periodically and, and so on. Uh, it's, it's quite a while before the child really starts to learn to be deliberate about its processes of peeing and pooping. But so that's a second stage that happens, right? The child has already gone through a substantial development when those parts of its body then start to become a bigger issue. And, and, you know, Freud studies that and thinks, what, what new issues arise for a child as this starts to become the way it interacts with the world and, and so on. <clears throat> and he, he, you know, he works out really a pretty, a, a pretty sensible sort of account of the things that happen between, you know, birth and about the ages of five. He's just he's just sort of investigating childhood life and saying, look, these are the things that children deal with. And you know, so I, you asked me earlier, I never quite got around to answering it. You asked me earlier something about, you know, what I'd learned from having a child. Well, so I can bring that up here, like uh, having a child and living with this little boy from you know day one up until now day seven. Like over those years, I saw a lot of things that were going on with him, and so that's a thing I've really. Uh, that's really connected with me with the study of Freud. Freud's account of the sorts of things that little children are deal with, dealing with uh, resonates very strongly with my own experience of what it's like to be with a growing child and seeing the kinds of issues that child deals with and how and how, how that child's very ability to be, be a person and 
be someone in the world and make sense of the world is really quite intimately interwoven with the processes by which it's gradually inhabiting its body, gradually developing new powers and so on. Anyway, so as I said, Freud, Freud's, um, Freud's writings, especially in his book, The Three, three, uh, three Essays uh, on the Theory of Sexuality, uh, Freud especially studies that and gives us, a, I think, a really profound account of these stages that children go through and what's happening and, and what effect it's going to have on a child uh, how you interact with it at those stages. So again, just very quickly, you know, that first stage where it's dominated by the mouth, he call, calls that the oral stage. He says that those stages of a child's life, which is, you know, the first, whatever, six months or so, the biggest issue, the biggest interhuman, intersubjective issue the child is dealing with is dependency. And that the the experience of, of um, nursing of course, gives the child, you know, uh, helps to satisfy its hunger and gives it nice tastes. But it's also this experience of bonding with this protective mother. And the, the, so the experience of nursing isn't just what sort of a, uh, a nutritionist would analyze and say, oh, this is how the child gets nutriment, you know, to Di you know that it digests, but rather that's the experience where the child is getting many of its most profound experiences of being supported and being loved. And so, so Freud says, you know, that's that's what you should really understand about a tiny child that the issue it's grappling with is dependency, and a child is going to, you know, things are going to go well for the child if in that phase, <clears throat> when the child really is dependent and is grappling with that if it turns out that its parents reveal that yes you can depend on us you know uh, similarly then at a later stage he said the stage that freud calls the anal stage when the child is first starting to learn about you know excreting and and the and all the things that are involved in that um <clears throat> for various reasons we don't need to get into freud says what's happening there is the child is really uh learning the other side, it's learning independence, right? The child is like, because the child is now sort of controlling its own body and it's up to the child, you know, when it's going to go to the toilet and it's, it's getting some responsibility in a way. And that's part of, that. that is how the child is dealing with these new issues of being someone on his or her own. And so again, <clears throat> uh, if the, if in that stage of development, parents are respectful and supportive of the child's experiences of independence well that's great that's that's going to be a really healthy and important part of deep psychological learning but that's also the part where something very deep inside the child can be quite crippled right if children don't don't get their need for dependency adequately met in the oral stage or if they don't get their need for independence adequately met in the anal stage they start living with sort of crippling problems, you know? And, and so, so Freud's analysis of those first five years of, of childhood really goes through these things, trying to identify by quite careful and insightful observation, trying to identify what the, what the deep psychological issues are that children are grappling with as they're growing into more and more sophisticated bodily functioning. And therefore, what the what the needs are, what the child's needs are from its parents, and also therefore what the potential impact of the parent is. You know, if you if the child gets through those stages by the age of about five or six, you know, in kindergarten or grade one age, the child has become a well formed person and they're kind of they're ready to go on to things where they are now more independently, could interact with friends and other people and teachers, and they, you know, they're gonna start uh, excuse me, they're going to start in a much more independent way developing as as persons and so on. But it really matters whether in those first five years they were set up well to do that or not. So if you get through those five years well, you, you know, you're on a good path. If you didn't get through those first five years well, then you're going to carry into your later development hangups that, that, where you never really got things sorted out or, or, you know, uh, in childhood. But again, the last, the last point I would say about this, again, sticking with Freud, um, it's not like the child is sitting there keeping a, 
self-conscious theoretical logbook about all these things that are happening, right? The, these things that are happening in the child are, are things that are shaping it in its personality and in its feelings, but not, at, not really at the level of ideas the child exactly understands. And so as the child goes on into later life, that sort of history of that impact of its growing up with its parents is going to be carried forward by the child, not so much in explicit thoughts, but in in feelings and hang ups and so on. And that's what Freud calls the unconscious. Like you're gonna you're gonna carry these things with you, but at a level you're not even really aware of and that you don't quite understand. It's just gonna be how you feel about stuff and what kind of reactions are triggered in you from things you encounter. And uh, I mean, and I, I think he's profoundly right about that. You know, that's that's what we're like, and that's why as adults we often we typically do need to go back and reinvestigate our own feelings and and their and probably our how those things are rooted in our formation in our dealings with our parents to try to sort out like what's going on with me why do i act this way around these people you know we often do have to go back and sort out our present problems by seeing how they are carrying on that a sort of troubled childhood history, you know, and that's that's what his his method of psychoanalysis is supposed to be about. So, you know, whether or not the exact details of psychoanalytic method are are exactly the right ones, I, I, that's not so much of a concern to me. But that that basic idea that that's what's going on with children, that's how persons are formed, and that therefore as adults. Uh, sorting out our psychological lives requires of us that we go back and explore these things. I, as far as I can tell, that's uh, 100% correct. And so that's, that is the, the way I have um, tried to carry these things over again, just to mention my book, human experience uh, again, um, you know, that's my own version of, uh, you know, I don't particularly draw on Freud explicitly, but I try to talk about my own understanding of childhood and, you know, I use a lot more of the phenomenological writers and so on. But I try to show how those things happen and, tr and try to show how uh, the kinds of problems that we do carry with us as grown-ups in, in all kinds of domains of our life do, uh, do have their roots in the, that kind of history and, and so on. So I, I have tried to give my own kind of, my version of a, con a contemporary telling of that story. But yeah, but, that, but that's, that's mostly what I think Freud is doing and why I think um, it remains a uh, profound, a profound thing for us to study. It's it, it's funny. I I love it because it's it's so simple. Kind of what Freud does is like, wait a second. Um, the the, the like like us today, we think our our experience as adults is really important. For for child for children, it must be equally or more so, right? So yeah. just think about it. You know, what actually is it like? Um, I've been thinking a lot as I see like a, a child like running t towards you know car to the house. I'm like, wait, this child is just running places. They're you know, what is it like to like have so much energy and yeah. you know they they, they just want to run places and they're they're shouting at a beetle on the floor. So that's yep. and relatively, I guess I wanted to I wanted to ask about maturity and mm -hmm. and almost what is it so maybe later on in life um um as we go to from adolescence into adulthood you know what actually is happening um yeah. I, I my motivation in this question is in a lot of our world today we think about how people aren't growing up fast enough or people are staying at home too late into their lives so there's also the, this issue of growing up versus not growing up properly so could you speak to this issue of maturity yeah, yeah. i mean that's a you know i didn't i didn't plan this when I wrote that book, Human Experience, but I, I have, you know, gone on essentially to write a series of books sort of studying the ongoing development of human life. And the last one I wrote was Adult, adult Life, <clears throat> excuse me, where I try to talk about that. I try to talk about what adulthood or maturity really means. Um, and what did I conclude there? Um, I think, I, let me let me lead into that by going back to the child again. You know, I talked about the the very young child as you know being very dependent. I mean, the, the, uh, so the child depends on milk, de depends on not being left to freeze in the cold or beaten by wild animals, but also is very dependent on love and support and human companionship, right? And that's what's really happening in those early stages. Um, but that, I think that it's worth it's worth uh, just underlining that notion of dependency, right? The child is really not equipped 
to just go out and you know fend for her himself in the world right they they need parents to buffer them from the full demands of reality and uh that it seems to me is really what happens as a child grows up uh the, the responsibility of parents is both initially to buffer the child but also gradually to introduce them to the demands of reality you know and people can do that in different ways there, there certainly are better and worse ways uh, but even just in the domain of good ways there probably are lots of different ways you can do it but you know children have to gradually feel the weight of taking responsibility for for things and really what that means is taking responsible for dealing with what's really there not the the sort of doctored thing or you know the buffered thing that your parents give you and so i think that's that uh, is the core of what adulthood really means it means or maturity it means becoming someone who can realistically deal with one's situation and so the, you know in, in a way it's a it's the natural result of a healthy upbringing you know because a healthy upbringing should be gradually empowering children to deal with real situations and if you've gone through that process of being sort of initiated into that carefully and well that should produce a result where you're ready to walk out into the world as an independent self-responsible person so that's more or less what i think maturity is i mean there are more dimensions to it but i think another way a slightly different way to put that would be being able to do what a situation calls for i think that's maturity right and so you know when i put it that way you know sometimes that means maturity depends on generosity right? some situations call upon you to give you know uh, some situations to deal with what the situation calls for you need to be courageous you know so you got to step up and do things even though it's dangerous to you um uh so being realistic uh itself you know we could talk about that like what are what are all the dimensions of involved in what it takes to realistically deal with something well there are a lot there are a lot of moral dimensions and so on but i think that's what what the key to morality is or to um maturity is it's becoming someone who takes on for him or her themselves the responsibility for doing what the situation calls for and i actually let me add one more thing after i cough <coughs> excuse me um i just have a slight cold um uh the way i put it there when i say taking responsibility for these things like it can really make it sound like um i'm talking about something very individual and i am talking about individuals taking responsibility but you know doing what a situation calls for being realistic it seems to me does typically mean being involved with other people to being realistic about ourselves typically means recognizing that we need companionship we need others we need love we need friendship all those sorts of things so so i don't so i i just want to uh not make it seem like i'm saying people should become hard you know individuals who do everything on their own it's not that but but nonetheless as individuals we are mature when when we deal with things i think realistically and dealing with things realistically includes recognizing how much we care for and need other people, how much we're dependent upon those and so on. And therefore it involves developing worthwhile, you know, intimate relationships and so on. But that's, that's a, that's, that's the, the sort of field of things that I think of as maturity. Um, I don't know if that gets at the exact thing you were asking, but that's, that would be my starting, uh, my starting move. You talk there about realness and how moving from adulthood out of childhood is about actually facing the real situations that yeah. aren't wrapped up by your parents um so um is there something there of experiencing then more of reality or experiencing like ontologically as in like how mm -hmm. reality is actually experiencing more of it would you be able to speak yeah. to that are we yeah. actually able to experience more of reality as a child and is that the right way to characterize it yeah that's i mean it's an interesting way to think about it and i do think there is something there like uh, first, I'll, I, first I will say yes, and I'll talk about them more. But then I'll say something on the other side too. 
Like, I think, I think my son has not yet, you know, really experienced the weight of uh, crippling anxiety. I mean, he's probably had some children deal with anxiety, but I don't think he quite knows what it's, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't know what it's like when, um, I don't know, you been going out with someone for years and they break up with you and you suddenly don't know what's going to happen or whether you finish university and suddenly find you have to get a job and you don't know what you're going to do or p people you really care about die or, or all kinds of situations that come up that can cast your whole world into doubt doubt and you you just don't know how to function you know he like he hasn't seen that yet so i think i think there are realities of what it is to be a person that uh, are still over the horizon for him. So, uh, and there would be other ones too. Like I think, you know, he's a, he's quite a smart guy and very interested guy. And so he is very interested in history and politics and war. He likes to talk about World War II and so on. And so he, you know, he, he tries to understand things about economics. You know, the things he says wouldn't uh, wouldn't cut it in uh, an adult economics class. But he, you know, he's he's getting somewhere, but. You know, it, really, there are things that that he doesn't understand. They're like he, he is trying to understand things that are still beyond him, and he's going to have to get older and really participate in the the world of having to earn a wage or having to deal with government policy. You know, it, it, before those things really mean things to him, right? Because right now, those are things he hears about, but he lives in a world where his parents, you know, make a pretty protected world, and he's, he doesn't. He doesn't have to grapple with that. So in those senses, I would say, yes, growing up actually does mean, in a way, dealing with more reality. Like the the there are dimensions of reality that are just unknown to the child, and it's going to gradually get to them. So in that sense, I would say uh, there's a more. But I want to say something on the other side, too, because I, I really liked your remark about the child running around. I just had exactly that experience right before I started talking with you. I was uh, with my son for lunch, came home from school for lunch, and we had to go back to school. And But before we did that, he just started running up and down the hall, shouting things, shooting guns, like he was engaged in some little imaginative play. And it's, uh, you know, I wanted to get to school, so I was thinking, come on, let's get going. But it was also, it's charming, you know, to, to see how thrilled and enthusiastic he is just about running around and, and playing. And the world in, for him right there is just such a... Uh, a place that sort of is welcoming to him and just allows him to uh, engage with these things that are really thrilling to him. And I look at adults and I don't see them running around like that particularly, you know? And so I think um, on the one hand, then going back to this thing, yes, as we become adults, we get sort of more involved in realities, but there are certain ways in which we tend to become less involved. Like there are some realities, there's some aspects of reality that I think children typically are much better in touch with than adults are. And that's really what's reflected, especially in this kind of eagerness and in their, their willingness, sort of, this is a side of that eagerness, their, their willingness just to throw themselves into something without, they're not worried about how they look to other people. They're not even particularly worried about consequences. They just, they just go for it. Uh, in some ways, I think that's a particularly mature attitude. Uh, and so as we grow up, there are aspects of being realistic that we tend to lose. And so in some ways, maturing should mean regaining some of those aspects of a child's perspective that we have lost. So it's not, so I don't want it to sound like um, growing up is just an un unambiguous trajectory, you know, forward to getting stronger and wiser and so on. I mean, that's part of it for sure. But, but I do think uh, our development in our development, there, there are really important things we're always sort of losing and, and um, losing touch with. And so part of the ongoing struggle in life is, is that we, or, or I guess I should say the ongoing struggle in life is that we both have to, you know, develop in all these ways, but we also have to hold on to the, the perspective we had and it's it's hard to keep both of those things going so yes uh the, so in some ways there are dimensions of reality that he has yet to be exposed to but in other ways he is clearly in touch with reality in a way that 
that I find educational. And it sort of reminds me, oh, yeah, reality should be like that. And I, I need to, I and others need to be a little bit more like children. Yeah, yeah, it's funny how you say that um, in some ways, children can be more mature, right? And, and uh, yeah. like appropriately not caring that, um, that other people uh, are there, but that they're going to do what the thing thing anyway. Um, and sometimes it, uh, for example, I, I think about uh, the philosopher and cognitive scientist John Vavakey, and he talks a lot about yeah. out serious play. And I and I kind of realize, I, uh, meaning we need to actually, you know, uh, embody roles and identities to to grow. Right? We we can't become a m- mature person or take a new job or you know um, you know c- become a father or something. You know, um, without kind of thinking and feeling and trying to embody what that's going to be like. Um, and so, in some ways, like maturity in a way kind of feels to me a bit about going back to childhood yeah. and taking things from there that we've uh, yeah. kind of lost yeah I, th- I, yeah I think that's very true i think you know go it's in a way it's like going to school like you're learning stuff you need to learn and it's that's great but uh but it can also it can also make you kind of hard you know it can it can be kind of deadening and and that's what growing up is like growing up like He's it's going back to my son, like he is learning about socializing. He's learning about how to uh, the discipline required to study and to behave well in the classroom and, you know, to manage his time. Those are really powerful things he's going to take with him into the future. It's good that he's learning that it's going to make him make for him a richer life. He's going to be a stronger and more powerful person. But but they're also kind of deadening. And, you know, so as as he goes through it, you know, I feel like, yeah little scars are probably forming, you know, all over his soul in little places. And that happens to all of us. And so I think, yeah, a very big part of maturity. I mean, this maybe again goes back to that issue of Freud. Like as we grow up, there are, there are deep scars. Some, some, of them, some of them are maybe more superficial. Some of them are very profound. But uh, maturity is both going along that path of development, but also... I guess you could to stick with my talk about being realistic. We need to be realistic about our own path of development, you know, and recognize, oh, ha- what was happening there, and you know, we have to work on uh, trying to keep our to re- recognizing problems that are developing in us and trying to keep ourselves alive to those things that are important that we maybe start sort of hiding from because they're a little uncomfortable or we have some scars or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think this this last point you made actually ties quite nicely back to that Freud and about the idea that maturity uh, is partially a sort of a forward moving path, but partially it has to also be a kind of backwards looking path <clears throat> where we try to take responsibility for sort out what happened to us in that process and, you know, try to try to bring ourselves into a healthy relationship to living and so on. Switching tracks a bit, I wanted to ask you about the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Sure. Could you tell me about tell me about him and uh, why you think he's important? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Heidegger is another philosopher that's been important to me. That that's one. You know, I said about Freud that I don't I don't really think of myself as a scholar of Freud, although I have studied it a lot and I and I it, it informs my thinking a lot. Heidegger, I'm more of a scholar of that. That's that that area of uh, phenomenology, European phenomenology is has really been much pretty much the center of my professional research. And so you know Freud was was writing uh, around the turn of the century like the late 1800s and the early 1900s and then Heidegger was writing in the 1920s, 30s and 40s and so on. And um the, I don't the, there's no particular connection between them uh historically, but the things Heidegger says, I think, are in some ways quite resonant with the sorts of things I was saying about Freud. With Freud's Freud's orientation is very psychological, like he's trying to look at childhood development and so on. Heidegger's is not like that, but but Heidegger uh, Heidegger's coming much more out of a you know the the standard tradition of philosophy where people argue about what's how does the mind work and what's knowledge like and so on, and he's. Um, so he's challenging various <clears throat> traditional things people have said about that that he thinks are wrong and and trying to give a new account of what our experience is actually like and that's what i think is is actually very compelling uh and but 
that account of experience he gives, I think, actually uh, dovetails quite nicely with some of these things from Freud. You know, what Heidegger wants to show is that, uh, I guess, I guess you, you, he wants to show that who we are is always kind of situated. You know, we when we when we think about ourselves, if I ask you, you know, what is a person or what are you like or something, when we try to answer that question, we often say wrongly. Uh, we say about ourselves that we're little like self-enclosed minds and we think about ourselves as having a bunch of little ideas up there and so on. Um, but what Heidegger wants to emphasize is, is that on the contrary, what it's really like to be you or me is that we're we're kind of wrapped up in a world. And rather than having our identities sort of tucked away in our heads, our identities are kind of thrown out into the world in the ways we're connected with all these things. <clears throat> that people are... A, a person is more like a network of involvements with with a with a situation or with an environment, and uh, uh, and so a person is more like a way of living in a situation. That's 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 kind of what a person is like. So Heidegger refers to that as being in the world. Uh, he says we're being in the world, and and um. And I think that way of talking is really powerful because he he starts to bring out all the dimensions that make up a person, and and one of the most profound ones <clears throat> that he brings out is that we we hold ourselves together as people pretty primarily by having a sense of home somewhere, and so <clears throat> you know I said we are situated in a core way that means we typically live with a basic sense basic sense of where our home bases. And that and by when I say where our home bases, I that's on the one hand probably is in a kind of straightforward way spatial. Like you could probably say this this place at this location. But it's but it's richer than that. Like you're at home with certain people. You're at home with certain kinds of activities, right? But so we 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 feel at home uh, in our house or in a neighborhood or with certain people or in certain settings, basically where things seem to us to be set up the way they should be and to be going the way they should be. And again, this is not at the level of theoretical ideas we have. That, like I was saying about Freud and the unconscious, this is at the level of the sort of background feelings we have, how, what what it is that just lets us feel like I'm okay. Things are okay. Things are as they should be. Um, but I, I think that idea is a very profound one that, that um, our identities begin with a sense of being at home. And again, connecting it again with Freud, again, Heidegger doesn't do this, but, but I will connect it again with Freud. Um, I think that thing I was saying about the child growing up with its parents is really about establishing a kind of home or establishing a kind of base, right? And that's that's really what's at stake in family life is helping the growing person develop a secure, reliable, uh, good platform that can be kind of the background for that person's life from which they can then go engage in the world and so on. Uh, but so, so I think of Heidegger as really bringing out the way that our identities are inseparably attached to places, attached to other people, uh, attached to certain ways of behaving, attached to certain times. Uh, you know that's and so that that notion of the situated self is the big idea I take away from him. You know there are lots of other things in Heidegger too, um, but that I think is the is the the particularly powerful point he brings out. And like in other words. That he's saying he, he against other views of experience or against other views of knowledge or whatever he's really saying this is where we start and you're not you're never going to understand what a person is like or what experience is like if you don't see that it always takes this kind of situated um networky kind of character and i i think that is a, a really uh I guess I could have added another word there too. I could have said embodied. I said, you know, you've got a place, you've got people, but you also have your own body and that way that's connected with things, which again connects us back with the Freud. But but I think mm. that's a I think that's the right starting point for philosophy. And so 
from Heidegger and, and others in the that philosophical tradition of phenomenology, I I really uh, rely on that idea that we have to be accurate and honest in describing the form our experience actually takes. And when we do that, we see that it is this complex situated thing. It's not a matter of a um, self-conscious little mind that's at the c- control control booth of a of choice or something like that. You know, those things happen too, but the core of us is the way we've established a kind of sense of home with places and people. I like the I like the way you talk about uh, home in this sense um, because it's not just about like the the objective nature of it. You you know you can't mathematically and scientifically like write down exactly. what what home is because it's it's about us and what's familiar to us. And I like yes. as well how like if we if we travel or we go to say stay at, stay at a friend's house or we go to like a you know a sports game we kind of also we we kind of create homes. Like yes. it's kind of like uh, we need it, you know. Like we'll be like, oh, well, that's the place that I'm staying. That's where my belongings are. That's that's where my friends are sitting at this game, and I'm going to be coming back to that. And uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's and it's it's funny because uh, when you when you start thinking like that, uh, you start realizing uh, how even in normal everyday situations, how many kind of unknowns there are. Mm-hmm. Like I think a lot about <laughs> rambling on here, but I think a lot about travel and mm-hmm. how um, it's so disorientating. Uh, even though it's kind of simple, you know, you're just you're moving your bags and, you know, you're having to get food and water. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so uh, with Heidegger, um, is, it, does he change things? Like, like, like I'm trying to think about philosophers that, that like afterwards yeah. we, 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 we can't really think the way we thought before, you know, how, how does philosophy shift after him? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think, um, I want to say one thing about the home business first, and then I'll come back and mm-hmm. address that. But but you were talking about traveling, and I think you know one thing that's really striking there is, yeah, when you go to a different place, like yeah, you still just want to get food and water, but uh, those things can seem very strange and mysterious when you're in a different town or even a different airport. Uh, things that you might have thought were so simple so, suddenly are just baffling when everything is strange, and and in fact, it can be quite intimidating. But in those contexts, one of the things that people often do is they go to things that make them feel at home. Like, so maybe they'll go to the place where they see an English person, you know, if they're, if they're English speakers, or uh, maybe they'll like to go to the place where there's a TV station broadcasting, you know, the BBC or whatever they've seen, you know, but, but, uh, or, or just things that look familiar. But I, but I do think the, in those situations, people seek out familiarity to ground themselves. And then if they, if they get a little bit of familiarity, well, then they feel like they have a base from which they can start to grapple with the strange things. But when you don't have that, uh, when it, everything is just strange, it, it's, it, it's like you can't get your bearings. It's, you know, it's not. So I guess the point I'm trying to make there about the strangeness is that it's not just that you would confront a series of neutral facts. Uh, and you know things aren't quite the way you're used to, but that's just a bunch of facts. It's not like that. It's they all have this aura of strangeness, and you and it makes situations just feel like you don't know how to interact with them. You can't you can't focus on them. You can't get a perspective. It can be very unsettling. Um, so I so I anyway I liked your point about traveling because I think it actually if if people think about their own experiences of traveling, they can really start to see that. But that also then leads into this other thing: Does Heidegger change things? Um, I mean. Uh, you know, I've read Plato a lot. And so I think when I go back and read Plato, I, I find in Plato pretty much everything I've ever read in the whole history of philosophy. So I, ge- I generally don't think of philosophers exactly as adding new things to the list. You know, uh, 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 I do think different philosophers are particularly powerful at bringing out things that typically, you know, one could find somewhere else, but probably didn't. But I think of these people as as really letting you see something, and I think different people can have powerful learning experiences, you know, from different sets of philosophers. But so, I, so I wouldn't automatically say that if Heidegger hadn't written, the, you know, the world wouldn't have worked out the way it did, or something. And maybe that is true, but 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 I, but in a way, that's not that's not the thing I think about when I think about a philosopher. What I do think is anybody who reads Heidegger seriously it'd be hard to believe they wouldn't have transformative 
insights and transformative experiences. You know, I think Heidegger, like any great philosopher, um, is just brilliantly insightful about what our world is. And you can't not learn and it can't not affect your life <clears throat> if you work on that. And so one of the things about Heidegger that I think he particularly powerfully brings out, it connects with this issue of travel and so on. <clears throat> so I was saying, on the one hand, we rely on these experiences of home, but it, but then Heidegger also brings out almost the exact opposite point about us, because he says about us, <clears throat> we are also the kind of being, persons are the kinds of being who can experience profound anxiety or, or they precisely feeling like we're not at home anywhere in the world. And that's not just a failing. That experience of anxiety is, uh, it can be very uncomfortable, but it's really an experience of freedom. And so the, the experience of anxiety is, in fact, or at least it can be, the discovery of our real freedom. And so, uh, uh, so Heidegger, in his book Being in Time from 1927, um, sort of charts that path from being at home to being in home. Uh, homeless or, you know, anxious. Uh, by homeless, I don't mean you're living on the street and don't have a house. I mean experiencing yourself as not at home anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and he really wants to bring out this point I was just making, how how that is on the one hand debilitating, that experience of anxiety, but it's also liberating because it's in that experience that we can actually feel Maybe this relates to my point about maturity. We can feel the weight of having to shape our own lives. You know, so again, as a child growing up, you have a comfortable sense of home, and like it just means everything's all right. You know, if you have a nice home, everything's okay. Every, there's a familiar stuff, um, and so you know, people can spend their whole lives just uh, operating in quite an insular way living with things that are familiar, even though those things might be um, racist, homophobic, uh, ob obnoxiously nationalistic. Like people can grow up with a sense of home where the things they feel comfortable with are very exclusionary and awful, you know? Uh, so the simple fact that you feel comfortable with it doesn't automatically mean it's the way it should be. And so, um, even in cases where home isn't so criticizable, uh, I think probably many children, maybe most children, you know, grow up and as they become adolescents, become teenagers, they do want to leave home. They want to go off and make their own life. And they, you know, if even if you had a nice home, you still want to feel like you're going to go do things your way. You don't just want to belong to that world. Well, anyway, so that so the thing about anxiety is that it it those experiences of anxiety can reveal to us, oh, the fact that you felt at home isn't going to save you. You know, you're, you're kind of on your own. You got to make your own life. Your, your life feels meaningless to you right now. And that means you've got to make it for yourself. It feels debilitating, but it's also liberating because it reveals to you that you can make it for yourself, right? When, if, if it is the case that it's, the world isn't going to hand meaningfulness to you. That also means it's up up to you to make your own life meaningful. And that, that really says, okay, you can start to figure out for yourself what you care about and how you want to sort of set up a world. So, so I think uh, one of the things that is particularly powerful in Heidegger is that idea that while on the one hand, we really def depend on this sense of home, that's not the last word on human life, and that the, our experience of being at home is actually going to be most fulfilled when it ultimately empowers us to take on for ourselves the weight, the burden, let's say, of having to make our own lives meaningful. And that can be, um, that can be hard, it can be un uncomfortable, but, but that's the route into what he calls authenticity. Right, authenticity is when uh, 
basically you've owned up to your own freedom and taken on the responsibility of figuring out for yourself what you think life should be about and trying to live that way rather than just relying on the terms you grew up with that say, yeah, just do this and everything will be fine. And that, that I think, so in, in addition to the specific points about our experiences being at home and situated and the specific points about anxiety, I think this, the point Heidegger makes about authenticity and this trajectory from being at home through anxiety to owning up to our own existence. I think that particularly powerful point is um, maybe the biggest thing he gave to the 20th century. I mean, I think that's that understanding of, of what it means to live an authentic human life, right? The idea that we have to accept our own freedom and take responsibility for making our own lives meaningful. I, I think that is... Um, I mean, it's an idea we've heard before, but we've heard it before mostly because of him and uh, other, you know, people from his generation who worked with that. I think that is a a hugely powerful life lesson and and you know, cultural lesson, a lesson in understanding what human beings are like. And so that's that's what I think probably is um, what I would identify as the 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 great thing he. He has to offer that, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and why it's going to be worth it to anybody to read that. But it's funny, you know, when when people read that book, being in time, it, if they read it seriously, it's very hard for them not to get caught up in crippling experiences of anxiety. Because as he leads you into seeing these things about human life, it's hard not to think, "Oh yeah, right, I guess that's me." And it, so it, it it's helpful, perhaps in. Uh, encouraging you to sort of make the this move towards being more authentic, but it can actually be quite a challenging book to read for that for that reason. It's it's funny because we were we were talking about home, and I was going to kind of ask, you know, then what is it like to to lose home? And you yeah. talk about well, that's that's anxiety. But then the the interesting thing then, and it's something I was kind of learning as you said it, is that in a way uh, we 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 will inevitably lose our home anyway or there's like as in growing up or just being here in the world we lose it anyway so anxiety and this sense of of homelessness is something we have to grapple with yeah um is that is that key to existentialism in general yeah. um I, I like think, like the, i think that yeah. is yeah i think that's the really the probably the the main the real key to existentialism. i mean there are various aspects to it but i think that's really what it's about the existentialism is really about uh, recognizing that we're free beings and that uh, it's really incumbent upon us to own up to our own freedom. And what that really means is it's always going to be up to us to make our own lives meaningful. And we often hide from that, you know, but, but that's, that's what really is the situation. There are no, there really are no prefabricated answers to what life is about like we we have to work that out and um yeah so i mean that's a that was a a very powerful uh cultural movement in the 20th century largely inspired by heidegger and various other philosophers in in that sort of circle his sort of circle and Given i think it's, what a, we've it's true talked about <laughs> go for it yeah yeah and um and, and and given this so we talked kind of about uh, anxiety and it's a theme we talked about uh, last time we talked too um i'm wondering if there's any relation of and if you'd be able to speak about addiction and yeah. uh what a- addiction kind of is like in this uh philosophical sort of embodied way we're yeah. thinking and speaking about right now yeah yeah um i mean i think i think of addiction as I think of addiction as just as a version of habituation. You know, when I, um, when I have to tie my shoes, I don't really think about it. I, I reach my hands down there and some magic happens with the shoelaces in my fingers and they're tied. Um, uh, and so the thing to notice about that is it doesn't require any thought from me. And it's kind of what is automatically drawn out of me by the shoelaces when I grab them. Uh, 
you know, that seems like a kind of a trivial example, but that structure, it seems to me, is is what habituation is always like. We, you know, I had to learn how to tie my shoes, but but the, the way I learned it is I did things a bunch of times, and and it got to the point where this thing just automatically happened. And I never, I don't really understand how it happens, but it does. But that's that's what goes on with any habit, and indeed, that's what goes on with making a home. You know, you get habituated to doing things a certain way and they become familiar and then it just becomes what we should do. Uh, but so through our habits, we we set up a situation where certain things in the world just automatically call out, draw out from us a particular form of behavior. And, you know, uh, one of the most common addictions is... Uh, addiction to, you know, cigarettes or um, uh, vapes, you know. And when that happens, when you, you, you do the same thing, you just get in the habit of smoking a cigarette or using your vape. Initially, you don't have to do it, but you do it enough times, and soon enough, the, just seeing that thing will draw out of you the, the desire to have it and the need to light it up. Um, and so I think... I think that addictions are are in that way then basically like habits. They're they're ways we we build into ourselves um, uh, a fixed way of responding to something in the world, such that we invest into that thing the power to command actions from us, to command behaviors from us. Now, things like tying shoes, like it wouldn't be that hard for me to buy shoes that didn't have laces and and uh, get away from that. Uh, getting rid of cigarettes is harder, but uh, but you can do it, you know. But but there, you know, there there. Uh, some of those things you can stop, but when they're habits that have wrapped up in them the, the deepest, most intimate issues, then they get very hard to 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 break to get rid of. So, you know, I think I, I initially said, I think addictions are kind of like habits. And I've said one reason why, but now I want to say something a little different, but I think addictions are also very much like things like phobias. You know, you, you just see a set of stairs and you panic or, you, or something like that. I mean, I think it's the same thing has happened there that some history of behavior of interacting this with this thing has invested it with the power automatically to summon up from you a certain kind of response. In the case of the phobia, uh, the thing that went into that is probably deeply traumatic experiences as they pertain to matters of profound significance, like probably your basic way of making a connection with your parents or something like that, right? Those so sort of things I was talking about with childhood. So I think. Um, I think whether it's phobias, tying your shoes, or smoking, in all of those cases, what you're seeing is basically how you made yourself at home in a certain specific form of the world. And what's now invested in the smoking or the fear of the stairs or whatever is the the sort of... um the flow of your psychological life you know you you made you've made that thing a structure that you now rely on to have your familiar fun way of functioning in the world and uh because you've you've built you the flow of your life through that path it's going to be very hard to change because changing that thing is going to mean restructuring the whole way you live right so so i think that's what addictions really are i think addictions are the ways we have dealt with uh a, a some kind of problem or some kind of issue in our psychological or typically interpersonal life and the way we found to deal with that has taken us through this particular practice and now that's how we feel at home and getting rid of that practice is going to mean 
it's kind of like this thing I was saying about psychoanalysis. It's going to mean going back and investigating what was going on with me psychologically when I built that thing up. I mean, you're going to have to go back and address what those root issues were, the ones you were getting away from by doing this. And, you know, that's especially then complicated if with things like smoking, uh, in addition to then all of the difficulties of breaking a habit and going back and investigating psychological life, just the feelings that come from so commonly getting nicotine are an extra thing you have to deal with, you know, or, you know, any, any other kind of um, addiction that specifically has to do with drugs that have effects on the functioning of your body, you know, you, you're just going to add an extra layer of pain and burden to your effort to change that when no longer using that thing brings this bodily discomfort to you, right? So, uh, but so I think that's, uh, addictions are the, are that way that we uh, embed the circuit of our life into some specific practice and changing it is only really going to happen if we can go back and sort out what, what, what problem we were trying to solve by doing that. And then we address that on its own terms and try to fix it. It's, it's, that, it's funny. That that, yeah. It's funny that you bring in fear because in, in talking to the clinical psychologist, Gary Hovanesian, he talks about actually that if, if, if you keep being afraid of something and you and you don't approach it, then 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 you're good. It's going to almost push you, right? And so the opposite of that then is kind of addiction, um, uh, the, the necessary sort of entwining of that, because then you're going down certain paths and not others. Right. And uh, and and uh, I wanted to to ask you about um, as your philosopher uh, about agency and free will. Um, yep. I, I see a lot of, of, of things on, online about, you know, and it seems like a really popular question people ask, you know, do we have free will? Do we not? Um, is it a meaningful question? And, um, and, and, and what, what would you say about whether we have free will? Yeah. I mean, generally I would say, no, it's not a meaningful, meaningful question. I mean, I, I mean, it's mm. meaningful in the sense that people have asked it for the entire history of human civilization and there's a lot to say about it. I w but I would say it's not meaningful in the sense that, uh, you know, the whole idea of asking a question is that uh, you have something on your mind and, it, you know, you, you could get a yes or a no and so on. Like the, the whole context of a question, it, or, or let me say that sentence differently, questions are phenomena of freedom. So if it's a question, it's already been answered, right? Um, so that's, so I, I would say, I I, th I think that the... I think that there's a kind of a self-contradiction in the very experience in which people doubt about themselves that they might be free. You know, so Descartes, you know, in, in the meditations on first philosophy, said you can't really doubt your own existence. You can say it, but just to, to say, I doubt it, you have to aff affirm yourself being there to, to do the doubting. And I guess I'm sort of making a similar point here. Um, I mean, in fact, I think Simone de Beauvoir says something like what I'm saying here in the Ethics of Ambiguity. But the the, the very the very uh, process in which you would doubt that you're free is putting your freedom on display. Is it putting the on display the fact that you can ask questions, that things are meaningful to you, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, in, in that sense, I would say it's not a meaningful question. But I don't really mean by that to to belittle it. I, I really meant there to bring out that idea that I think the very asking of the question already shows what the answer has to be. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think the thing I was saying about Heidegger and anxiety and so on, like the, these are, these are experiences we have uh, where we recognize profoundly that something matters to us. It matters that that the that our life lives be meaningful, whether you call it freedom or not doesn't matter. the 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 reality that is attested to you in your own experience that something matters to you, and that's that's the that's the that's the answer. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, though, is you could we can really um, misunderstand the nature of our freedom, because we often think of freedom as meaning, oh, I can choose this or that, you know, I can just do things myself. And part of 
you know, if you think back on the things I was just saying about addiction, part of the things, part of the thing you see when you think about addiction is how much you're not si- simply free in that sense that I just said, right? The the simple presence of the cigarette draws out of you the the action of smoking it, you know. So they're, they're basically through our habits, we we build a world that kind of controls us. And uh, the the choices that we do make and the thoughts that we do think are not things that we just crafted entirely on our own. They're things we've taken over from our upbringing and especially from these things I was saying about the how we enter into a dynamic of recognition with our parents and so on and how we were formed. So, so I think, so what I would say about freedom is that in some is that on the one hand, I would say, yes, we certainly are free in the sense that things matter to us. And um, any person can find that out for him or herself. But it doesn't, but, but saying that we're free in that sense doesn't mean that we're automatically, uh, I guess, in control of ourselves. That that very thing that is our freedom, we discover was shaped by us i guess through those formative processes of childhood and whatever so that by the time you or i as an individual kind of come on the scene make, choosing a life it's a big part of us was already designed for us you know by our earlier selves and so who we are was sort of shaped for us kind of behind our back by our by our own not yet well developed childhood selves in interaction with our parents and our society and so on and so, yes, we're free, but we also kind of find our freedom is controlled by a kind of alien force that we don't really understand. And that's then again that challenge that to to really be free is going to involve a, a process of ourselves sort of sorting ourselves out, trying to figure out who we are and then trying to own it. Um, is, that, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. And and. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting that we kind of have to like, uh, grow into freedom as well, that, that it's, it's, yeah. it, it, again, we kind of mis- mischaracterize free will because it's, uh, it's not something we can just do as isolated beings. We, there's, there's, it's almost sort of a continuum of it. Right. And so in addiction, for example, yeah. you might think that there's a bit, there's a bit less of it. Um, well, there's a final thing I wanted to yeah. touch on this podcast. And I was thinking about this as I prepared, which is, um, I've been thinking about AI and uh, and economics about how you know will it take over jobs and imagine yeah. a world where there's no work. What is the importance of work, and what do you oh. think would it would be like to to be in a world where where there was no work or there was no meaningful thing we had to do with our time? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think work is is a I mean it's a great topic. I think work is a profound part of life. Um, you know, Marx in um, 1844. Uh, wrote about the unhealthy character of work in contemporary industrial society. So for many people, work means just putting labor into some job you have no reason for doing for a meager wage. And when we think of that as our model of work, uh, work looks bad. And you think, oh, wouldn't it be nice not to have to do that? But, But Marx's point was that is that is debased work. He calls it alienated labor. That's that's work that um, has become a burden and and fails to do what work really can do. And Hegel, who I mentioned before uh, with the dialectic of recognition, uh, also talks about work in a much more positive sense that I think Marx is drawing on. And, and Hegel says, when you when you work on something, you you have brought yourself into engagement with the natural world or whatever and through working uh, so many things happen like you you learn how to interact with nature you you sort of learn how to uh almost like in a dialogue how to sort of respect its terms but also bring about something that you're interested in like if you grow a crop let's say uh, or or something like that right um uh and you learn about nature, you learn about your own body, which is itself part of nature, but you, you like learn how to access the powers of your body to get things done. And you, you learn about yourself 
that you're capable. You learn your own powers and hence develop, I suppose, a certain level of self-respect. And then especially when you make something, that product, you know, as well as maybe being a thing you want to enjoy, if it's dinner or whatever, or a house you want to live in, it is also an ongoing testament to the fact that you can do things, right? It's, so it's quite profoundly important for your own sense of yourselves, sense of yourself. Uh, and of course, through doing that work, you may be building, you know, a house for your family, or you may be contributing something to the community, you know, so through, through the work where all those other things happen, you are also contributing to the construction of a, of a valuable environment for the other people you care about and so on. So in that sense, unlike that kind of alienated wage labor uh, that Marx was talking about, work in that sense I was just talking about with from Hegel is one of the healthiest and most important things we do. And that's part of what Hegel wants to show, that work is a, an essential part of the path by which we become mature persons. So again, if I think of my son, you know, I don't, I don't set him chores around the house. I've never, I've never particularly liked that, that because that seems too much like wage labor to me. But he does all kinds of work on things he's interested in, and he loves working. He likes, loves to help me do things. He loves to work on his own things. Like he's, he's, you know, eager beaver or whatever you would say. You know, he just, he's at it. And and it seems to me it's through his having projects, through his get, um, encountering obstacles and working through them through his developing bodily skills, like when he learned how to swim. These things uh, are the processes by which he's really growing up and, you know, becoming a, a person. So, um, so I think, first of all, uh, in, in light of this issue about AI and work and so on, I think the first thing is that it, it, there, is, there is a really troubling way in our society in which the reality of work is sort of misunderstood and misrepresented. I think it's it's it would be very important for people to understand what work really is and to see why it matters. Um, I do think, uh, like you know, ever since the Industrial Revolution, people have made things they call labor-saving devices. But mostly, what that means is they saved employers from having to pay for labor. <laughs> so, any kind of uh, machine basically removes the need to pay workers because you got this thing that's going to do the work now. And so AI is a, is a particularly sophisticated version of that, but that's not new. So I imagine, yes, it will take a lot of jobs for sure. Um, uh, but I don't think it could ever do away. I don't think anything could ever do away with the inherent need for work and its importance. What would be bad would be to produce a society in which people actually couldn't work in a meaningful sense. And I do think, not specifically about AI, although this is maybe a, a part of what I'm about to say, I do think a great deal of our contemporary technology is geared towards something like that, like set things up so that you never have to know where you are, right? GPS, like nobody knows where they are because, they, you know, uh, set things up so you don't have to open a door. There's always a but button you can push and the door will open for you. Um, the, our technology seems very directly oriented towards removing from our daily life all of those places where we actually function as bodies engaging meaningfully with the world and and developing as agents you you, you mentioned agency before i think i think work is at the core of agency and our our technology i don't i don't think of it as generally making life better i think of it as a very invasive thing that is uh, eliminating more and more of our access to the essential domains in which we have to develop the skills and the capacities by which we become agents. So that's the thing that I'm I'm concerned about. I mean, of course, I'm concerned about AI uh, removing various kinds of employment from people. That's serious for sure. But I think the more serious thing is technological developments in general that in fact, impede our ability to engage in the practices that make us agents, which roughly means get in the way of our just being able to do meaningful work in the world. That's so. That's a that's my view on work. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I uh, like I've been talking to uh, like an economist who's kind of like, look, 
doesn't think that it will take so much work like work and in fact you know capitalists are really good at making jobs for people and, and the you know the labor share of capital has been constant but um you know what like i really like what you said and like one thing i heard recently that stuck with me is elon musk talking about like he really believes no like seriously like th there will be nothing that like we can do better <laughs> you know like like i think about how like sometimes it sounds, seems it sounds absurd to me that there would be no work because like surely there like there's always problems right um there's always you know so could there be no problems so like i don't know do you, do you think that that if i like, imagine that happens you know and and like we generally do you think that art and these kind like can things replace that agency you know i guess i guess some of the things you said about technology are very i guess highly good which could critique critique technology and yeah. that and that um you know it, it helps it is great but also um the strange thing is is that as you say um we need to build skills too because that technology in a way is ephemeral right so if that's taken away then 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 what can we do you know i think uh I think kind of a lot probably unnecessarily much about like i can't start a fire i can't actually you know provide for myself if i was like in the wilderness yeah. you know and i'm so reliant on culture so yeah yeah i mean i think um there are lots of nice things that come from machines uh for sure but but i think that idea that machines do things better is just wrong uh and i think it's a it's actually a kind of a highly destructive misrepresentation to say that um i mean uh, uh and i and it's and i also think it's it's kind, in a way it kind of misses the point like to, the idea that it would be better for a the door that the machine would be better at opening a door than you um even if it were true which it's not um hasn't bothered to ask like why would you ever want to open a door and it, it's and there are many things where the thing that's valuable about it is that you do it you know if if uh, it, it, it wouldn't make any sense to say somebody else could sing this song for you i mean they could sing the song but the, but there wouldn't be any sense in which you were doing the song now they would be doing it you know and but maybe you want to sing you know uh, or uh you might want to feel the earth under your feet it wouldn't make much sense to say a machine could feel the earth under your feet better than you could but it might it might be able to detect certain things you can't detect but the whole point of that is that you wanted to do it and that i think is true of almost all of these things you know so people sometimes might say that about gps like i ask my students sometimes why they use gps and they say oh because you know it'll it'll be better at finding the place and I, and i think again that's a real mistake uh first of all they're not better uh they they make all kinds of mistakes because they're not intelligent but even apart from that it, what it really means is people have given up their sense of knowing where they are and knowing what what uh place is and that is of profoundly more importance than knowing how many minutes it's going to take to get from some point a to some point b so i think that the in other words those 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 matters of technology they're designed to solve problems you might say but the problems they solve typically are are not the same as the reasons why that thing should be done in the first place and so that's the, the thing then that i'm i'm concerned about so that's that's why i think uh, to say that those things can do things better uh, I, i i certainly think i understand what a person might mean in saying that but i think it's a mischaracterization and it's and it's a mischaracterization that actually um conceals the fact that it hasn't asked why should this be thing be happening at all you know yeah that's it's been fascinating uh talking so um uh do you have any last words and and if not where where can people find you uh i mean they can do i have various books that they can find but they i have a youtube channel that's a good place to start uh and my only last word would be uh thanks thanks for talking it's a very nice for you to ask me